Well, welcome to this edition of the 700 Club. A catastrophic storm in the Atlantic, Dorian, set to swoop down on Labor Day. Residents from Florida to South Carolina bracing for a monster hurricane. Will it become a Cat 4? Meteorologist Joe Bastardi is joining us now uh, to give us the storm's track. And here's Heather Sells. Just in time for the holiday weekend, Hurricane Dorian is moving towards the U.S. mainland. Forecasters expect it to strengthen and hit anywhere from Florida to South Carolina. I've been through Andrew, I've been through Wilmer, I've been through Irma, and I don't want to go through this one. <laughs> the National Hurricane Center says Dorian will only get stronger, and that has people in Florida and along the East Coast getting ready. On Wednesday, Dorian's high winds ripped the Virgin Islands, knocking out power to two islands. But it largely spared Puerto Rico, centering about 90 miles north of San Juan. It's a huge relief for the U.S. territory, still struggling to rebuild homes and its power grid after Hurricane Maria. This satellite video shows lightning in the eye of the storm as it passed, an indication of how quickly it's strengthening. Dorian has now moved out to open waters. Forecasters say it will grow into a dangerous Category 3 storm. A major hurricane uh, by Saturday is what we're expecting, and then continue to a major hurricane as we get really close to the Florida coastline. As Dorian approaches the U.S., new reports show the Trump administration taking money out of FEMA. $155 million going from the FEMA Disaster Fund to support detention facilities on the border. Regardless, the president has promised that FEMA will do a great job responding to Dorian. You must have an evacuation plan. Uh, be sure to fill your gas tank. For now, the pressure is on in Florida and up the East Coast. Florida's governor has declared a state of emergency, and he's calling on residents to gather seven days worth of supplies and follow this storm closely. Heather Sell, CBN News. Well, here to give us his analysis on Dorian's track is Joe Bustarty, Joe's chief meteorologist for Weatherbell Analytics. Joe, good to have you back with us again. Listen, is this thing going to hit Florida? Will it go Cat 5, do you think? I don't think it'll go Cat 5, but we think it uh, uh, has a good shot Cat 4. What it's going to be, though, Pat, is a fist of fury. It's not going to be like Irma, where Irma was spread out all over the place. You know, Irma had hurricane-force winds extending 150 miles out from the center. This one's going to be much more focused and concentrated. And uh, part of the reason is the weather pattern over the Caribbean and in the Western Atlantic in general is not that favorable in the large scale. So the storm has to stay small. It is going to stay small, relatively speaking. It's not going to be one of these things where the storm's hitting Florida and already the clouds are into North Carolina. Remember how big Irma was. But that being said, if it stays small, once it makes the bend back to the west, that's when you'll see some intensification. Already this morning, uh, some of the drier air that has been around has tried to work its way into the storm, and it's been fighting that. But you also notice, folks, it would not go west into the Caribbean. If it had gone west into the Caribbean, it would just die. Uh, into the Central Caribbean. That's a graveyard of storms at this time of the year. It becomes more productive for development in the Caribbean later in the year, but right now, this is heading right for the area that in our preseason forecast, we said you got to look out for outside of the Caribbean. So it's, a, it's an ugly-looking situation. So what can those residents expect, those, those in, say, Fort Lauderdale or uh, in the path of the storm? Well, we, we've still got several days. It is, you know, my, my favorite saying with the weather is only God knows tomorrow. The rest of us just guess. But uh, the fact is that looking at this, it's going to be approaching that area uh, Sunday night and Monday. Now, the slower it moves, the slower it moves, the better the chance it tries to turn northwest just up to the east coast of Florida. And uh, that would mean that, well, they'd have a formidable storm from Fort Lauderdale to Jacksonville, but if the center stayed just offshore, it'd be like what you had in Matthew. Remember, Matthew stayed just offshore. And as a matter of fact, the end game of this could be very close to Matthew, where you have a storm that's 
hugging the coast all the way up to North Carolina, perhaps Virginia Beach. So it, it'd be about a week from now, uh, this could be impacting folks all the way up into the mid-Atlantic states. But for right now, my take is that on this northwest path, it'll hold its own, maybe uh, fluctuate up and down. But once it turns to the west, you know, the old-time meteorologists, I guess I'm getting to be there now, 64, mm -hmm. but I was taught when you see these storms bend and come back to the west, look out, that's when they're going to really intensify. Well, Joe, let me ask you this. Uh, this is hurricane really number one, I guess, this season. What's, what do you think's coming down the road? Well, I think, you, I think again, uh, much of the area that got devastated by Irma, you notice how uh, Irma and um, uh, Maria and the, the Caribbean, much of that area has probably got lower than normal activity. The problem is, Pat, we forecasted what we call scattershot season, where things that, things that get in close to the United States coast, you saw what happened with Barry, right, intensified near the coast. This is the same kind of situation. So the definition of an active season, even though the total season may be at or below normal, an active season to me is if I get hit by a hurricane, it's an active season, and we definitely have this southeast United States threat now. Well, Joe, I appreciate it. And please come back, and I want to stay with you <laughs> as to what's happening. Appreciate it very much. Well, pa Pat, why don't, you have, why don't you have me on when there's a big high-pressure system around? Everybody's going to associate me with terrible weather. <laughs> we'll get some beautiful weather going up. This will be the man to forecast a beautiful sky, <laughs> sunny skies and following winds. I so, love it. <laughs> well, in other news, the British Parliament is closed for business. Why? It's the Prime Minister's latest action to pass Brexit. John Jessup has more on that. And Pat, Queen Elizabeth did not object to Boris Johnson's request to suspend Parliament until mid-October, just two weeks before a vote on Brexit. Opponents say it's a coup d'etat, making it harder for Brexit opponents to press for a better deal as the UK leaves the European Union. This is about trying to stop a majority in Parliament coming together to avoid a no-deal Brexit. Johnson says it's not an attack on democracy and that he has good reasons for, for suspending Parliament. Brexit supporters say they will oppose Johnson if he tries to negotiate a new deal. However, they do support, Pat, a clean break from the EU. You know, I want to say, folks, that is going to be very dangerous. So what about tariffs? What about the uh, workers back and forth? What about trade back and forth? All this has got to be worked out, and none of it is going to be worked out. It's going to be a clean break. They're going to leave. All right, now, how about Germany? How about France? How about the Great Britain and the uh, Dominion uh, affiliates? What are, the, what are their rights going to be? What about travel? What about visas? None of that's going to be worked out. He's just going to get out. Big mistake. John? Pat, a U.S. cybersecurity stopped, um, attack stopped Iran's Revolutionary Guards from targeting tankers in the Gulf. According to American officials, the June attack destroyed data and computer programs critical for attacks on tankers and other vessels in the Persian Gulf, where 20 percent of the world's crude oil is shipped. U.S. intelligence says Iran is behind attacks on oil tankers in the Gulf and the downing of U.S. drones in May and June. It also seized a British-flagged oil tanker earlier this summer. The attack shut down military communications networks, and Pat, Iran is still trying to retrieve lost information and restart those computer systems. You know, I've been saying this all along. We have, in the United States, the most sophisticated computer system in the world. Why should we stand idly by while those guys hack us and beat us up and take our, steal our data and, and hold us hostage is going on in various states right now as hackers are stealing the data and then holding states for ransom. We have the best in the NSA in the world. Thank the Lord we finally used it. But it's, it's a, a bloodless war. You're not shooting people. You're not sending your troops out. But you can disrupt the supply chains, the command and control of any army anywhere in the world. And I'm just pleased that we finally are using the weapon that has been made available to us. I might add something else. Regent University has a special designation by the NSA. Uh, it's called a National Center of Academic Excellence in Cyber Defense Education. That's not a bad thing. We now have a degree in cybersecurity and uh, 
uh, it's among only, uh, well, it's, it's, it's just a 4% of the universities in the nation that has this uh, honor. We have a, a, uh, a beautiful uh, center with, uh, we've now, we, we're, we're ordering, we haven't got it yet, we're ordering an attack feast, and we've been, we've been able to model a uh, cyber attack but now we're going to have the necessary software to launch an attack so people can sit at our cyber range at Uni uh, Regent University and uh, can actually learn how to uh, go after the people who are, who are uh, these cyber attackers. And it, it's a great education. Well, there's something else that's went on at Regent University, and John's going to tell us about that. That's right, Pat. Speaking of which, Regent University held a special ceremony dedicating its campus chapel yesterday. And our very own 700 Club host, Pat, as chancellor and CEO, was part of that ceremony, dedicating the chapel to businessman, investor, and philanthropist Jack, Jack Shaw and his wife Jane. The building is now known as Shaw Chapel. Pat described Jack as a dear friend for decades and led the prayer of blessing over Shaw Chapel, committing it to the Lord. The chapel was originally dedicated on March 22, 2013, and is designed after London's famous St. Martin in the Fields. Pat, looks like you all had a great time together. Well, it was a wonderful time, and we had uh, the, the Chancellor's Chapel. The place was full. We had, we could hold about a thousand people, and they were all their prospective students. But the Shaw family, Jack, Jack, and his father, uh, Irby, have been friends for years and years and years. I mean, 50, 60 years. And uh, this is a nice thing. They made a significant gift to the university, and we, we're just delighted to see them. Well, the chapel is so beautiful. What a yeah. wonderful legacy they've left. It, it really is. It's a lovely, lovely building. As I say, it's, it's modeled after St. Martin's in the Field, which is one of the most famous chapels in the world. It's right in Trafalgar Square, right around from the uh, London uh, Gallery of Art, right in, in London. And this is the famous chapel, and, and this... The outside is, you know, identical to that. Mm -hmm. so well, it now sits it's a beautiful in the center place. of the university. Yeah, it's a big place. Yeah.